Street gospel, light of the temple. Saw a swing, kill a lie from the ghetto. The hood messenger, let them know hell's close. Black burial, the devil in a black cloak. Yo, what is up? Welcome to the Street Gospel Podcast. I'm your host, Dave One. And this is episode number... What episode is this, Cam? Episode number 21. So if you caught episode number 20, uh, it was kind of like a breakdown of how we did the podcast, how it started, kind of our vision of the podcast. Um, You know, so we appreciate you guys. You know, I didn't think we were going to make it to 20. I mean, it was that fast anyways. It was was kind of tough there a couple weeks. You know, we guests cancel. You know, they can't make it. Uh, You got the holidays, the Rona, you know, all this craziness. And then all of a sudden, you know, we just started jamming and we got to number 20. But today is number 21. And uh, I got a really good guest today. I'm I'm really happy about having this guest here. He he drove all the way down here, man. It's it's a long drive, (laughs) you know. But uh, Inland Empire guy. Um, And, you know, I always like to play some some cool music. So. Everybody knows we, we, we usually play some lo-fi, a lot of hip-hop, but this guy, is, he's, not, he's not really like that. I'm not saying <laughs> he's not into hip-hop, but I just I found a little track that I think he might dig. So with a little introduction, you know, I got I to gotta play a, a little something for this guy. So this guy is a believer. He is an artist. I mean, he's a renowned tattoo artist. I mean, people that know, uh, tattoo artists know this guy. He is a father, a husband, a business owner. I mean, this guy pretty much does it all. So I want to welcome him to the Street Gospel Podcast, Jacob Donnie. I mean... Look at that track, bro. That was the most epic introduction. And I know you say that to everyone that comes on here. But <laughs> and then you going down my resume, I'm like, wow, you're making me sound so much better. I've never heard it back to myself. Like you know, I'd, I'd, I'd play a little punk, you know, there. I see Thank you. That actually that. was Not my bad, childhood right? right there. Right right there, right? Yep. It's, it. it's, it's got to be it, man. I will say, though, when that intro came in, I was waiting for my verse to come in. I was, <laughs> like, I was feeling that beat. I was like, okay. <laughs> I know, right? Is that when you put like the the little English accent to it a little bit? You know, yeah. I, I don't understand. It. You know, yeah. you get the pop punk bands, and then all of a sudden, or it goes super <laughs> high. You yeah. know what I mean? But uh, hey, man, thank you for coming down. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. It's I been so cool. It. Looking forward to this because I mean, you and I go way back, and I was excited to catch up in person like this and it, have it be candid. You know, because you and I haven't been in person in a room like this in a really long time. So I think, yeah, I think it's been at least I would say. Maybe four or five years since yeah. we caught up. I mean, I stopped at your shop yep. in uh, was that Grand Terrace, right? Yep. And uh, we were at your tattooing. It stopped by real quick. I think I was working over there at the Loma Linda Hospital. And uh, yeah, man, we've been friends for a while. I don't even remember. Do you remember how we met? No, I'm try. I was actually trying to think about that on the car ride over here. I don't know if it was through Max or because I mean, you were the first. Christian brand that I did a t-shirt design for, but I was even trying to think about how that came about. Yeah, I think I think it might it might have been through Max. It might that sounds been, about right. It might have been through Max, and then uh, I think I think we hit it off pretty good, man. I think we yeah. were uh, we just got along good, and it's kind of it was kind of funny because we're, we're we're a lot different, but a lot alike in the same way, which is uh, so cool, man. Especially when it comes to fellow believers, you know, because I tattoo all kinds of people that. We're nothing alike, you know. Right. On paper, we're totally different. But yeah, it's just that camaraderie. You love art, you know, like you have a good eye for design, things like that, things that I can appreciate. And you're just a cool dude, you know. So Thanks, I, I kind of like, even if I am different from someone, I like having an open mind and be like, what's this guy got to say? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. And I, I've always felt that way with you, even with the design, you know. Like when you would come to me with the design, sometimes it'd be something that I was like, you know what? I've never done anything like this, a little different than something that I would picture to do. But it was always fun because it switched it up. So right, yeah, it's been a it's been a good ride, man. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the the logo right behind me, the praying hands with the street gospel. Uh, Jacob did that for us. Like I don't know that that's probably uh, that's probably like at least eight years old. Yeah, I, I was say. gonna say it's right? gotta be old. But it's so cool because when I look at it, like 
art like that is kind of like tattoos. It's a timestamp. Like I remember where I was at and just being hyped to do that logo for you. And I didn't have any clothing stuff myself. So it was like, man, this is going to be on a shirt. It's going to be dope. I'm excited. So, and your stuff right now, uh, I've been watching your, your, uh, your Instagram and, um, I mean, bro, I mean, you've been putting a lot of merch lately, yeah. I mean, which is, which is super dope because when you're the artist, I mean, that, that just, you just have the vision when you're a guy like me and you want to make a shirt, you, you're trying to relay the, the image over to the artist, right? But when you're the actual artist and you're making your own merch, you kind of have the vision of where you wanted to go and how you want it to look, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the cool thing is, is that I've had experience, you know, I met Max through working at Famous Stars and Straps uh, over in Ontario. And honestly, I knew nothing about the apparel industry. You know, I knew what I, what I liked on a shirt or I knew how to draw certain things, but I knew nothing. So I think opportunities like that or doing stuff for Solon or even doing stuff for you, just working with different people, there was a lot to learn. So I'm glad that I didn't do clothing. I mean, I tried doing a clothing company. I think it was back in like 2009. But even then, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. So I think I needed those years and years of working with other brands and seeing the behind the scenes stuff to really know, okay, this is how it works. And I'm still learning. You know what I mean? And that's kind of the fun of it. So I think just because I've been tattooing and drawing my whole life, you know, this is a whole nother realm. So I had to go into like, okay, how can I learn? You know, who are the people I can learn from? And that's kind of still where I'm at, man. And it's fun. You know, it's fun when you're learning, you know, and yeah, you make mistakes and being able to look at those mistakes and go, hey, you know what? Yeah, I jacked up right there. But, you know, you learn, you grow. So do, do you look back on your art and just say, oh, is there is there, is there some little things that you're like, ah, that was, that was wrong? Or, yeah. Because there is some rules to 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 art, right? I mean, there I, is. I don't know that. But there's, there's good and bad about both, right? So, like, I can look at something like, oh, I would have done that different. But then I look at it and go, at the time, that was the best thing I could do. So wow. for that reason, I'm like... Hey, you know what? It's it, and it's cool to see that growth, you know, because you're like, hey, at the time, that was like the pinnacle, and then now I look at him like, oh, I would do this a little bit different, a little, you know, a little better. But I think it's cool to look back on it, man, because it, it, then you see your growth, and you know, it just reminds you of a good place in time, you know, like just like the stuff I did for you. It's like, man, I remember that feeling of being excited to see my art on your shirt, and you know, you and I became friends, so it was exciting, you know. That's dope, man. Yeah, I lo- I love all the stuff that you're putting out. You you put out. Uh, from shirts, I mean, I saw some keychains, some some leather goods. I mean, I seen your your flash books. Yes, um, and you said you have a compilation flash book right now, right? Yeah. So the new one that's coming out is called Keepers of the Faith, and um, you know what? That was actually really inspired by my father's passing. I know that sounds weird, but you know, my dad passed away in January, and uh, you know, I was just really reflecting on my faith and things like that. My dad was always really big on like, hey man, if you got if you got talent, like use it to glorify God. And I realized, I was like, have I really been doing that? You know what I mean? Like, don't get me wrong. Like, everything I do is for, you know, good reasoning in my own mind. But I was like, I want to do something, especially given everything that's going on in the world. I was like, everyone feels lost, at least from what I'm seeing on Instagram. I was like, I want to put a little bit of hope out there and just kind of remind people like, hey, you know, God loves us and we have hope, even though we're living in times where it feels like there's no hope. Um, Especially in tattoo industry, it's very taboo sometimes to talk about your faith and things like that. Um, but people that follow me, they kind of know where I stand on it. And I was like, you know, I'd like to get some dudes together. Um, and it actually started out as I was like, oh, it can only be Christian tattooers, you know, cause I want it to be special. But then a couple guys who aren't Christians were like, Hey man, I want to do a sheet. And then I was like, you know what? Yeah. Why am I keeping it only Christians? Like I, right. you know what I mean? It's, I think this should be, just be something cool that maybe if they're not Christian, they might go into going like, man, this is really cool. It might get them thinking, you know? So it ended up turning into that. So I think we have about 30 artists and, uh, the pre-order started today and those will be done probably about a month. And we've had really good feedback, man. That's dope. How yeah. many pages is that flashbook? Uh, so 30 total. So I just put out one called soundtrack of my youth, which was basically all music inspired flash. And I love that boom box that you put on the front. Thanks dude. Let's see. Yeah. It's, it's crazy, man. It's crazy what the the quarantine did because for me, like I've always been a hardworking dude, but I think it pushed me even harder to pursue things that I normally didn't have time for. So was, these were all ideas I had, but it was like, I don't got time. I'm always tattooing. Right. So I think it kind of gave me that push. Like, all right, you got the time now. So um, I knocked that one out in about eight to nine months. You know, it started off as just doing a couple of paintings. And then next thing you know, I was like, I'm like 10 paintings deep. I was like, I should make this a book or something, you know? And then... Yeah. uh so I think once the idea was there, that's just how I am, man. When I get an idea, 
I mean, obviously I run it by the wife. That's something I've learned because there's, I mean, I got to realize that not every idea I get is a golden idea, you know? Right. But I just told my wife, I said, Hey, I got this idea for this book. What do you think? And she's a straight shooter every time. She'll yeah. be like, that's stupid. Don't do that. You know? <laughs> but she was like, yeah, I think that's really cool. You know? So she inspired me. Same with the clothing, man. I was surprised I wasn't tattooing. I wasn't doing anything. And I, I was talking about making some shirts and you would think, you know, being my wife and knowing like our financial situation that she'd be like, why is this guy trying to make t-shirts, you know? But I was like, Hey, you know, I really think this would be a good time to try to get the clothing right. thing going. And, uh, she's like, I, I back it a hundred percent. And That's I was like, dope. how cool is that? You know? Yeah. Cause a lot, cause to really, when, it, it's different from, I mean, not to say that you, you don't put out money to tattoo somebody, you know, there's ink, there's needles, there's, there's lighting, there's a shop you have to yeah. pay for. But there's something about shirts and getting a bunch of merch, putting yeah. it in your garage or wherever you put storage, wherever you may put it, and then saying, I got to order this much because this is the minimum. Yep. And then I got to hustle to sell it. And, yep. and and you're hoping, I mean, you have a great following, but you're hoping in your head, like, I hope this sells. But there's always that little voice making, like, this sucks, man. This, yeah. is not, this stuff's not <laughs> flying off the shelves like I wanted yeah. to. And I just put out all this dough, right? Yep. And it, it, it keeps you humble, you know, because it's like, there's been things that I'm working on. And I'm like, man, I can't release this because people are going to go crazy for it. And then it's a dud. And then I'll put out something on a whim that like, you know, I'm sure it's the same as writing a song. There's probably people that write songs like, ah, oh, this is kind of junk. And then people love it, you know? So I think it's very much that way. Um, but I do like when it's something authentic, like I, like everything I put out, I try to make sure that it, it's something I'm really feeling, you know, at the time. So there has been ideas that I've scrapped. So I'm like, you know what? I did that. And it, 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 it feels like I'm trying too hard, you know? So let's, Let's take it back a little take bit. Back. Yeah, you know what I mean? So I think staying true to who you are, and like you were saying about following, you know, I do have a good size following, but I think something I've I've been trying to focus on, at least within the past year, is, you know, really catering to the people that are actually, like, paying attention, you know? Because right. you could have a ton of followers, but no one's buying your stuff, yeah. you know? So for me, it's, like, trying to be aware of, okay, who are these people that are buying my stuff? Why do they like my stuff? And how can I make those people happy? So that's really that's been a dope. learning curve, too, you know? Are, are you good about getting back to people i am yeah I, honestly because that's I probably am. one of the hardest things i think it for is. anybody right if you have a ton of fall i mean i have a small following with the with the podcast and with the brand and stuff but i mean sometimes you're just overwhelmed with regular everyday life you have, yeah. you have a small family um you know your business and then trying to get back to customers clients appointments all that so since i just recently posted that i'm tattooing again that got out of control where people were just like I can't compare it to anything, but it's almost like upsetting in a way because people, they, they kind of feel like they own you. You know what I mean? They're like, what's up, dude? Like, how come you're not hitting me back? You know, like, and it's, it's hard to, to stay on top of that. Yeah. You know what I mean? But with the brand stuff, it's like, Hey, you know what? I ordered this shirt two weeks ago. Um, I haven't gotten it yet. What's the story? You know? So it's like, for me, it's like, okay, you paid money already. I'm on it. Right. So. I think with different, it's it's a totally different scenario when it comes to like customer service with a brand and then a brand new person I've never met saying, hey, I want to get a tattoo. Now, don't get me wrong. Those are just as important, but it's like I'm one person, man. I can only make sure, you know, <laughs> there's going to be people that slip through the cracks that you forget about. But the way I always look at it is the people that have time in my chair, the people that know me, they know right. I care. You know, I it, it's just one of those things that I had to learn along the way is you can't please everyone. You right. know what I mean? And the thing is, is that there are going to be people that don't like you. And that was very hard for me the longest time. I was like, man, I want everyone to like me. I don't want to have any enemies or anything like that. But it's like, at the end of the day, you know, I got to put my family first and then the business and things like that. So anything outside of that, you got to kind of prioritize. So. You, you always, to me, maybe not now, but when we first met, you seemed like you were a guy that wanted to please everybody and said yes to probably more yeah. than you can handle. Yeah. Just to be nice, right? Oh, absolutely. And like, what's funny is my wife's the same way. My wife has a small business and, you know, we talk about this constantly. She's like, hey, this person, you know, is, is reaching out to me about this. I really don't want to do it. What do you think? And it feels weird being the person to tell her like, hey, no, you just need to shut that down and tell them, you know. And I think if you're up front with people, they respect that. Right. But I think with me is I would get so overwhelmed. I'd be like, oh, I'll just blow that dude off or whatever. And it's like, that's not cool. You know, I think you should yeah. at least let people know like, you know, I'm not feeling this or check it out. This guy will do just as good a job and he could probably use the business. So I think honestly, man, especially after quarantine, yeah. um, it's like, I was so grateful. I had all the business. Cause I was doing commissions. I was doing so many things to where I was as busy, if not busier than I was tattooing. So I was grateful. 
for all those people. But at the same time, it was like, you know, I'm one person. I can only take on so much. Yeah. So. My, my, my buddy Ralph always tells me that, that we never factor in our time. Yeah. Right. We factor in the price, yep. you know, how much it's going to cost, you know, but uh, he always says like people tell him for his business, he does a, a printing business and he says that people will say, oh, I can go to LA and get it for $50 cheaper. And yep. he's like, see ya. Yeah. What's well, stopping you? You, you, you want to drive to LA <laughs> yeah. an hour and a half, an hour and a half back and you're, you know, and you're going to waste gas. Yeah. Here you're paying for convenience and you're paying for your time. He says, always factor in your time yeah. because it's valuable. I think that's a really good way to look at it. And I think with me, it was, you know, I remember the early years of tattooing, just wanting to be the big name in tattooing. I mean, obviously that's changed over time, but it's like, like they say, be careful what you wish for. So it's like, you know, now I'm at the point where I have to send business away. And yeah, that like, some people say, oh, that's a good thing. But for me, I, that bums me out. But at the same time, it was like, you know, I always wanted this, so now I got it. So it's like, all right, you got you to gotta deal with what right. comes with it. You know what I mean? So, and, and I try to, you know, the people that I can't tattoo is I, I try not to make anyone feel like they're less than or like, oh, I don't want to tattoo you. It's just the reality is I'm one person. Right. You know what I mean? And same with the brand. It's like I package and ship. I, I do all of it myself. And eventually I'd like to have people helping me. You know, it's just... I don't know if you're this way, but it's like when you like stuff done a certain way. Oh yeah, you'd rather just do it yourself, and that's yeah. how I've always been. People think I'm crazy. They're like, "Dude, how do you do all of it?" I'm just like, my wife's like that too. The funny thing about my wife though is she has certain ways to do things around the house, and she wants it her way. And then you volunteer to help, and she's like, "No," and yeah, she'll boy. overwhelm herself <laughs> because she wants to do it a certain way. And I'm yeah. like, "Come on now." Yep. So have you always been? A great artist or when did you know that you had some talent i mean there's some kids you know some artists that i know and they said you know since they're a kid they can draw i have a friend that i that i knew in like early junior high days and he always could draw and and now he's like a, a designer for uh for a shoe company yeah and i, and I trip out i'm like dude you always could draw you always had a good eye for stuff did you have that early because i know max told me no, I didn't have none of that. Everything I did, I, I worked hard at, and, and, and I had to get to where I had to get. I I did, to be honest. Yeah. Like, and, I, and I'm not going to say I was dope in the beginning. That would be a lie. But I think the obsession and just the general knack for it, yeah. And the earliest remem memory that I have, and it might have been like kindergarten or first grade, I remember the teacher talking about, okay, we're going to do this big poster, and you guys got to each pick a group. And I remember right when she said, go – all the kids yelled out my name. They're like, we want to be in this dude's group because <laughs> it was a drawing assignment, you know? And I was like tripped out. Like it made me feel like kind of good. You know, I was like, what the heck? Like all these kids, you know, want, want me to draw their thing. So I think that was the earliest memory, man. And I, I mean, shoot, I must've been seven, you know? And that stuck with me to this day. And yeah, you know, as time went on, you know, like especially in high school, everyone um, would have me draw on their folders and stuff like that. And like, you know, my mom always gave me lunch money, but there would be days where, like, you know, she would be gone to work or I wouldn't have lunch money. And I remember I would just draw on people's folders, be like, shoot me five bucks, and that's how I'd make my lunch money. You'd hustle for that. Yeah, I oh, had to. So. I remember Cam, man. <laughs> he always had lunch money, but he he's like that side money. Yeah. And he used to make some, some those origami things out of paper and try to hustle them at school. I'd come back with a few bucks, yeah. and I used to be like, oh, good for you, kid. You got a little talent here. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, that's a trip that you said that because – I, I at least loved to draw when I was a kid, dude. And uh, I remember trying to enter this contest, and I worked all night, worked all day on on this drawing, and I went to go into the contest. And I remember this kid, man. He walked up, and I think you had to draw like a like some sort of monster, or and I drew this monster. And I thought I was cool, man. I thought it was ready to go. And this kid just walked right up, man. He just put his his monster on the teacher's desk, and I looked at it, and I go, dude. That is good. And I was just thinking in my head, like, I suck. And I yeah. think that, that was, I think that was the end of drawing for me, yeah. man. You know, that in like seventh grade uh, drafting class. And I was like, yeah, I, I, I don't have it. But yeah. how did you get into traditional uh, art? You know, did you always like it? Is, was that your passion or did you like something before that? So what's weird is I would say art pursued me. And I know that's a cliche thing that people say. But as long as I could remember... I had a pen in my hand and I was always drawing something, you know, and I think as a kid, it was, it was escape from reality. You know, like if I, if, if I got home, there was nothing to do, like say kids now, 
if there's downtime, they're like, grab the tablet, you know, do this. Right. It was always drawing. And it, 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 it was something I just never thought twice about. It was like in my DNA. So I think, you know, growing up, there's not a time period in my life that I think that I wasn't drawing. You know, when I was in elementary school, I always carried a sketchbook. And I would wow. draw characters. I would, I would draw shoes. I remember I was probably like 13, but I remember I was always like, if I, if, cause I was skateboarding at the time. I was like, if, if anyone ever asked me to design my own custom shoe, so I started drawing like my own custom skate shoes. So I went through so many phases. I was really into cartooning when I was young, really into comic books, anything that involved a lot of imagination. So like I did how you were talking about, you know, at contests and stuff. When I was in, I think it was like third grade, they had a contest and they were like, you have to draw on a huge poster board something that you think would be a good invention that could help the world. So I drew this big futuristic car that could fly over traffic when there's a car accident. Nice. Pick up cars because it could turn into a plane, so it could pick up the cars, take them off to the side of the road, so that way traffic could keep going. Nice. And I remember, and I and I didn't win, you know, but I just remembered that feeling of putting myself out there, you know, and it was in the auditorium and everyone's arts all lined up, and just that feeling of like stepping it up, you know. And right. I was so young, you know, but I just remember that feeling. It was like there was a task at hand. I had this thing that I felt like I was decent at, so I was like, hey, you know, the worst, worst can happen. I don't win, you know, so. I, I don't remember who won or anything like that, but I didn't even care. I was just so stoked that people were walking around and seeing my art, and that was probably like the the earliest memory I have of getting a reaction off my art and let it, and displaying it out for criticism and things like that. Was yeah. anybody in your family artistic? My grandfather was, um, but I didn't know him. He passed before I was even alive. But my dad would show me like his old sketches and stuff like that. And my mom was really creative, but no, that that's what's crazy, man. Like I said, it just. It was like born in me because my mom said like when I was five years old, she's like, you would post up on the couch with a pen and paper and just be drawing. And that that's how you entertain yourself. And I've been like that my whole life. Like anytime there's downtime, I'm drawing. And, and, and when did you uh, get into tattooing? Okay. So I was drawing a little backstory. So I've been drawing my whole life. Went through, I mean, when I'm young, I wasn't raised around tattoos or anything like that. So like I said, I would draw cartoon characters. I would, so you, uh, you, you guys were clean cut. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and, uh, well, I was raised in a divorced uh, home. So my mom, you know, she was a believer but wasn't, you know, going to church every Sunday, things like that. So she was – she kind of gave us a little bit more leeway, you know, as far as, like, when it came to piercings and stuff like that. My dad was, like, church every Sunday, you know – you're not getting a tattoo. You're not listening to that music. You know. That so you, would you stuff. go with your dad sometimes, and then and you're living with your mom, but you would go with your dad. Yeah, I would say. Well, I was with my mom majority of the time, so my mom was like the cool, fun parent, and yeah. my dad was like the one that I had to like kind of act on my best behavior. around. Carry you your know? Bible in your back pocket, yeah, take out your exactly. piercings, do all that stuff. It wasn't until later that I realized that that contrast was actually a good thing because I learned both good things from, yeah. from those two different dynamics, but. um so where, where do you lie in as a parent? Are you like right in the middle? You know what's funny is I see a lot of my parent, both my parents in me. You right. know what I mean? I can see myself being easygoing and carefree about certain things like my mom was. And there's sometimes that I can, you know, kind of pull that whip pretty tight as far as the way my dad was. You know what I mean? And stuff. So, um, but yeah, so I was drawing pretty much my entire childhood. And then um, it wasn't until high school. So I was about... 15 or 16 and i came down with an anxiety disorder right hit me out of nowhere so um i started doing homeschooling and then that was really hard for me you know because i was a really outgoing dude hung out with a bunch of different groups in school hung out with the punk rock kids you know the popular kids all kind of, you know like i i jumped around a group so i really liked being social so when i had to do homeschooling that was like kind of a huge adjustment for me but again like because i was like put at a crossroads just like this past year it was like okay what do i do you know like let's 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 make something out of this time so i was homeschooling and one day i well because i used to walk up to the 7-eleven by my house uh just get a bag of chips or something you know and i, I walked up there one day and i'm looking through the magazines and i see a tattoo magazine and then I, i'm flipping through it and then i go to the very back and they used to have this thing where people could submit their art and then if they liked it they'd put it in there and i just remember thinking like Ooh, this is this is art because I would do like I'm looking at your graffiti stuff right here. Like I would draw graffiti even even though I, I was no part of graffiti. It was just like anything that was fascinating to me. I would try to recreate it. So I bought that magazine. I went home. I started drawing, and that was the light bulb moment. And you know, it's this, funny. This, this is crazy because this is like a this is like a like a movie scene, right? It is. The dude. kid walks down. 
you know, uh, he's getting home school. He, he just get, goes to 7-Eleven. He sees the magazine. I mean, it's unheard of now, right? Because yep. in those days, it was always go to the back of the magazine. You would see some sort of contest or something, yeah. right? Yep. Remember the, the the draw the pirate or draw the, the oh, I did the, that the too, turtle the guy, right? I, I submitted one of those, believe it or not, when I was younger. Um, so, yeah, it was weird. It was just like something went off in me where I was like, this is dope. This is something I'd never seen. And it really challenged me artistically, but it, I just felt like I resonated with the imagery. So I remember I, I just sat there, I redrew it, and then uh, I told my mom, I said, I said, Mom, check this out. You know, I, I'm really thinking about maybe getting a tattooing. And she was like, yeah, yeah, Because at that point, like, when I was younger, I'd go through phases. You know, one day it's like, oh, I want to be in a band. You know, every kid goes yeah. through it, you know. So I think I was still finding myself. Um, but it was at a pivotal moment in my life because all my friends were talking about college. Like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go to college. I remember my mom asking me, she's like, what are you going to do? Cause at that time I was failing school. Like I was flunking high school and I was like, man, I got to figure something out. Cause I didn't want to be a loser. You know what I mean? But at the same time I was like, shoot the way I'm going, I'm not getting into college. School wasn't like for that. you. It wasn't. Yeah. And that, you know, what's funny. I loved school, like the, the academics out of it until sixth grade. It was like, once I went to middle school, it was just like my interest in school just went out the window. And I remember I used to bring my folder to school and I would just, hole punch white computer paper and just draw during class wow. every day. Yeah. So when everyone was doing their math and all that, so it was like, I stopped caring and I'm not proud of that. You know, I think everyone should finish school, you know, and I, I just think I was so hyper-focused on art that nothing else mattered. But there's, there, I mean, school's not everything sometimes, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, and, and you had some talent that you knew that was there somewhere. Yeah. And it, like I said, it was pursuing me. It was like this thing that was chasing me towards like, I can't ignore it. It, it was consuming every bit of my life. Um, and I did more than anything else. You know, if there was downtime, I was drawing, you know, like I, I, I rode skateboards, I rode BMX, I did things like that, but I always came back to this. So I think that's what I mean. It, it, it found me, you know? So to answer your question about, you know, how I got into it and stuff. So then, um, I told my mom that I wanted to, to get into tattooing, but I didn't even know what that looked like. I wasn't raised around tattooing. I, I had no idea. And then it was my 17th birthday. I, I walked up to my mom and said, hey, mom, I said, one more year, I'll be old enough to get a tattoo. And she was like, why do you have to wait a year? And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, I'll tell you what. She goes, you can get one now if you go to the shop that your brother, because my older brother, you met him, Joe. Joe, yeah. Yeah, so he had a tattoo um, from a guy who was actually the bass player of Boxcar Racer. Okay. So you got to think, I'm a huge Blink-182 fan at the time. So I'm like, okay, I'm 17. Not only am I going to possibly get a tattoo, but it's going to be from the bass player of one of my favorite bands, you know? So my mom goes, here's the deal. She goes, I'll, I'll let him take you down to the tattoo shop. If he's not there today, you can't get it, and you got to wait till next year. This is uh, a one day only. So in my head, I'm like, please let this dude be there, you know? So my brother drives me down there. Sure enough, we walk in. The dude's sitting on the couch. I remember, like, perfectly. Dude's sitting on the couch, flipping through a tattoo magazine. He's like, oh, what up, Joe? You know, they start talking. And he's like, how could I help you out? And he's like, hey, this is my little brother. He wants to get a tattoo, you know, and, and they're chopping it up. And I'm, I'm like in La La Land. I'm like looking at the walls, listening to the music. And that was the other light bulb moment. I said, this is it. I was That's like, it. Because I was always kind of a misfit, not by choice, but just, you know, my older brothers listen to punk rock, heavy metal. They, they dressed crazy. So it was like being in a tattoo shop. It was like, oh, this ain't our school. This ain't, this is, this is me. It was kind of like this summed up my personality. You, you found home when you went to the shop. I did. Yeah, absolutely. So that day I was like, okay, like it, it ignited something in me. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to soak up this moment, you know? So the guy's like, yeah, hey, what do you want to get? So I pulled out this drawing I had in my uh, high school folder, actually of a sacred heart, which is actually this one right here. Nice. And, um, so you drew your own design. Yeah. And nice. like, I mean, some people nowadays would say, oh, you got your own art tattooed on you. That's lame. But I didn't care, man. I was just like, well, I'm going to trust something that I drew more than just picking some random, you know? So I gave the artist the, the design. He goes, you drew this? And I was like, yeah. He was like, how old are you, man? <laughs> and of course I lied. I was like, I'm 18. You know? <laughs> and then uh, he showed all the guys in the shop and they're all like, dang, dude, that's pretty dope. And then that like, you know, obviously I was like, more got confidence. me all fired up. Yeah, I was yeah. like, damn, this is cool. You know, like I just met this dude and he digs my art. So then... I ended up getting tattooed by him. He didn't ID me. He just had me fill out the paperwork. So that's the only reason that, that I was able to do that. And then the whole time I'm getting tattooed by him, I'm just picking him brain or picking his brain. Like, Hey man, how'd you get into it? This and that. And what was cool is a lot of guys won't tell you that stuff. You know what I mean? But I think he saw how, how passionate I was about it. So this is what he told me. He goes, 
go home and draw what's called a flash set, which is, you know, those pages that you see when you walk into a tattoo shop of all the designs. Right. He goes, draw five or six flash sheets and then go to all the local tattoo shops, show them your face, show them your art, tell them what you're trying to do. He goes, and then, you know, if, if you can go to the Pomona tattoo convention, that's coming up. So I remember I told my mom, I made it a goal. I don't remember what month it was, but I told my mom, I said, I said, whenever the, oh, you know what? So my, I got tattooed in March. I'm doing the math now. And the Pomona Expo was always in July. So between March and July, I think that was my deadline. I was like, okay, I'm going to draw a flash set and I'm going to have my mom take me to the Pomona Tattoo Expo and I'm going to go around. Mind you, I'm 17. That's insane, bro. Yeah. So, but it was weird. It was like, I was so hyper-focused. What, yeah, that's what I was saying. It, what's so crazy about that is you were so young. At, at that age, I mean, if a guy came into your shop and, and was, you know, 17, I mean, I, yeah. I'm sure you'd ID him. Yeah, right? <laughs> of course. <laughs> but, but you know, he comes into your shop and, and, you know, and he tells you, you know, oh, I want to do this. You're just kind of like, yeah, sure, kid. A little pat yeah. on the back and see you, see you next time. Especially you know nowadays because I, mean? I, I feel like kids nowadays – I'm not speaking for every kid, but they want it easy, man, you know, and I'm so glad that I had to go through all the hoops that I went through because I think if you're really hungry for it, you're just going to jump through every hoop until you get there, you know, and, and I'm surprised I was willing to do that. But like I said, at that time, I was they must've fun- seen some talent. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Which, which, which helped me, you know, right. and that gave me a little bit of confidence. Like, okay, you know, I do have a lot to learn, but at least I'm not, you know, too on much the right of a track. newbie to where I should just pack it up, you know, and call it a day. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's exactly what I did. I remember I went to the tattoo convention. <laughs> My mom drove me. Were you, you know? nervous? I was, but I think the excitement overtook the nervousness. And, you know, I was walking into, like, this whole new world, and I just really didn't know what to expect. And I remember I was walking around, and just being in that atmosphere was so cool, you know, being being that age. And I was walking around each booth. Hey, my name's Jacob. You know, I'm in high school. These are my drawings. I'm selling this flash hat. And people were like, wait, how old are you? <laughs> you know, and I was like, I'm 17. They're like, that's dope, dude. And I remember it was cool. Like, even though people were, you know, getting unpacked or getting ready to tattoo, a lot of dudes, like, set some time aside and they're, like, kind of give me some pointers and that's stuff. Dope. Was your yeah. mom, like, scratching her head like, oh, we got something here? I th- well, you know, I, I don't know. Like, I'm sure she was, but I think she was probably just excited to see me actually following through. Because at that time, I would talk a lot, but there was not a lot of follow through. So I think... When it came to tattooing, she wanted to see me actually make some moves, you know? So I, yeah. maybe f- from her perspective, she's probably like, okay, cool. He's actually doing it, you know? Right. And I think she was sad, too, because she really, you know, none of my siblings went to college. So I was the youngest. So it was kind of like, all right, he's my last hope. So I think the fact that I wasn't going to go to college, she was probably like, all right, well, there goes that idea. But she was supportive, though, man. That's one thing I will tell you. That's, like, that's dope. You know, I love that. I'm I'm very supportive of my kids. I'll drive them wherever they need to go. My daughter does photography. My son does video. Uh, my dad was always like that with me. He, yeah. He'd, I wanted to be a rapper. He'd buy, you know, some instrumentals and be like, here you go. Yeah. You know, make a song to it. Whatever, whatever it may be, you know. Um, but uh, I think that that's great that your mom was like that, man, because it, 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 it means a lot to a kid, you know. And when you see the kid that is really, like, driven and wants to do it, you know the parents ultimate heroes when they just yeah encourage a little bit it might not be what we plan for our kids but yeah to 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 motivate them to help them get to where they want to go i mean it they always remember that absolutely and i and at that time you know i had no idea where it was going to go or anything like that i remember in regards to my dad my dad wasn't too stoked on the idea you know i remember i had to kind of ease into telling him what i was planning on doing (laughs) Did he get mad about your tattoo? No, he wasn't mad. Uh, well, <laughs> let me tell you that story. So after I got it, I wore a hoodie around my dad for like months, right? So the day I finally gave Summertime, up. Summertime, I'm wearing yeah, a hoodie. <laughs> yeah, so I actually didn't get my driver's license till I was 18. So that shows you it was about a year. So we roll up to the DMV, and then it's hot out. I got a hoodie on. And finally, I'm like, you know, I'm taking this thing off. I take it off. Two seconds after I take it off, he goes, what's that on your arm? And I was like, oh, it's just a tat. Like, try to brush it off, like, real quick. He goes, let me see that. And I'm like, oh, here it comes. He goes, that thing looks rad, man. And I'm nice. like, you're not mad? He's like, no. Nah. He's like, why didn't you just tell me? I was like, I thought you'd be mad. He's like, he's like, we're not going to get them everywhere, are you? I was like, I don't know, Dad. That's but dope. Yeah, so he, like, it made me feel kind of dumb. I was like, oh, I should have just showed him, you know. And I think, you know, he would talk to me and be like, hey, you know, like, I just, I'm worried. Because, you know, my dad, his goal was always for us to be close to Jesus, you know. And he was just like, you're going into a world that's full of sinners 
and all the you know like he, I think he probably pictured the way it was back in his day like bikers right dealing drugs out of the back and things like that and I had Sailor to kind of tell him, yeah <laughs> exactly so I had to like kind of tell my dad it's not like that and actually the first shop that I worked in was um, owned by a, a pastor wow. but I mean he was he was what you call like a ex biker turned pastor so he's a little rough around yeah. the edges still but I mean you know he was always listening to Christian music and really cool guy you know. So I try to tell my dad, I'm like, hey, dude, I'm, uh, you know, the shop I'm trying to work in is the guy's a pastor. And I think that kind of made him think, like, okay, you know. Right. So he came around. It, I will it, say still that. still have somebody to keep an eye on you a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And that's what's cool about tattooing, man, is, like, even though tattooing is full of misfits and, like, people that usually come from broken homes or have, like, you know, a checkered past, it's like a family, man. And some of the, the best life lessons I learned were not only from non-Christians, but just from tattooers you know what i mean that because even though i had a father and i had a mother like there was a lot of just life lessons that i needed to learn that i didn't learn till i got into tattooing because because you're kind of uh you're an apprentice right yeah there's there's certain things you have to do and you have to learn it it's uh you know it's kind of like discipleship in the church you know what i mean if you really want to be a good disciple if you really want to come up the ranks the right way you have to be under somebody yep and kind of learn the lessons listen do all the small stuff and and a tattoo shop's kind of like that in a lot yeah. of ways, right? I mean, that's it is. I mean, even a even a good tradesman, you know, he's got to be an apprentice first before he yeah. can become a journeyman. Yep. So there's I always say there's 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 a lot of good in that because you really learn it's considered the old school way, yeah. right? But, but yeah. there's no fast way to learn some of these things. There's there no isn't. fast way to learn about about God. There's no fast way to learn about tattooing there's no fast way to learn about sheet metal or construction or anything like that you kind of have to get underneath somebody and kind of just take your lumps right yeah and with that is not only did i need to learn things about tattooing but like the dudes would school me you know what i mean as far as you know how to deal with people how to deal with conflict things that i hadn't learned at home so it was good for me man just just growing into manhood i think i needed to be around all those dudes and just I mean, they taught me a lot, man, so I'm grateful for that. But to circle back to how I got into it, so what ended up happening was, you know, at the Pomona Convention, it was a really good experience, and I got a lot of good feedback. Um, But I remember uh, the guy who did my first tattoo, he also said go to all the local tattoo shops. So I went to all the local tattoo shops trying to sell my flash. You know, some guys bought them. Most people were like, ah, I can't help you, but your your art's dope. And then I went to this one shop where the guy had – his phone number on the thing said, like, be back soon and his phone number. So I called the phone number. I'm like, hey, man, I'm at your door trying to sell some flash. He was like, hey, I'm getting a haircut around the corner. If you're down to meet me, I want to check out your art. Oh, so cool. So sure enough, my mom gives me a ride to the local haircut place, and he's there, and he's looking at my art while he's getting a haircut. He's like, you drew this? And I was like, yeah. So he goes, how about this? He goes, I need help with my drawing. He goes, if you teach me how to draw better, I'll teach you how to tattoo. And it was like, yeah, what? Yeah, so that was my break, you know, because I was because everyone Dude. everyone kind of warned me, you know, they're like, hey, you know, plan on spending a few grand for your apprenticeship and things like that. And like, don't get me wrong, my apprenticeship was still hard, but the fact that he was just like, hey, I'll straight up trade you, I was like, dang, you know. So That's I think, sick. yeah, so I think the more things started to fall in line, um, the the better and better things got. But I mean, even with that guy, so I worked for that guy for maybe six months to a year. And then he ended up closing up shop and then we, you know, we cut ties and then I was still living at home. My mom was like, look, if you're, if you're living under my roof, you got to have a job. Cause at this point I dropped out of high school cause I was, I was so dead set on tattooing. Were you doing any tattoos or you were just kind of no, still just No, I was just trying to learn. learn. Okay. So, um, no, actually, yes, I was sorry. So the first shop that I worked at, the guy did teach me how to tattoo. Um, I wasn't doing good tattoos, but enough to where like, I remember, you know, because I was friends with a lot of guys that were into skating and punk rock, you know. So the shop that I was at, it was just me and the owner. So on days that the owner wasn't there, I would call up all my buddies. And they were all still in high school. So you so had they, a ton of people to practice on? Yeah. So I remember they would come over, you know, they would bring beer and food. And we would just listen to music super loud because we were in like kind of like this little ghetto um, complex. And everyone closed early by five, you know. So it was like, you know, I'm like 18 at this time getting a party with my friends, tattoo them. <laughs> and I remember there was one day I went home with like 300 bucks in my pocket. And I'm like, dude, nice. I went from like not knowing what the heck I'm doing with my life to now hanging out with my friends, doing art. And I just made more money than I used to make in like two weeks at a job, you know? It's crazy. Because I had a job as a dishwasher, worked as a busboy, you know? So I had other jobs leading up to tattooing. 
So it was like, man, I'm getting paid to do art. So it was like, once I got that taste, it was like, there's no looking back. That's so, so sick. Dude. Yeah, it was cool. But I mean, with that, you know, even though I got a taste of it, there was a lot of hurdles that came, you know, after that. Um, so I ended up working in the shop in Rialto for about, I'm trying to think, about a year. And that was for the pastor. So after the first shop I worked at closed down, my art teacher, um, what was cool is at the time I was in AP art class. So she would let me do tattoo drawings and turn them in as credit. Nice. Because her whole thing was like, I want to hone in on what you're passionate about instead of making you draw stuff that you're not into. And I thought that was really dope. So that's one class you passed, definitely. Yeah, that was that, which is funny. <laughs> that was the one that I, some days I would go to school late just so I would be there in time to go to that class. Wow. You know what I mean? So, and then one day I'm sitting there at my desk and she just drops a newspaper on, on my, uh, on my desk. And I'm like, what's this? She goes, Oh, they did an art up article write up on a guy who's a pastor and he owns a tattoo shop. And she knew that I was a Christian. So I was like, okay, so I'm reading it. Called him that day. I get home from school. Guy was a total jerk. Had like music blaring in the background. <laughs> he's like, he's like, how can I help you out, man? And I was like, Hey, I'm trying to learn how to tattoo. Yada, yada, yada. He's like, all right, bring your stuff down tomorrow. <laughs> so just real short. So then sure enough, the next day I go down there with all my art and he was like, dang, he's like, you're further along than most people that asked me for a job. So he goes, what would normally take probably two years. He goes, I think in six months to a year, I can have you doing tattoos. So I was like, cool. Sign me up, you know? So a lot of, a lot of, the, a lot of your doors that open up was, was some luck. Yeah. But you had the talent, right? Well, I had the body of work and that's the yeah. thing. Like I think if, yeah, if I would have showed up empty handed, I might not have gotten the opportunities or just would have been more work to get in the door. But yeah, I think that helped me, you know, because if, if it wasn't for me failing school, it was like, okay, I got to do something. So I was constantly drawing. So I had a portfolio by the time I was like 17 of a good amount of work. Yeah. Cause a lot, a lot, a lot of people always, you know, it, 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 there's a little bit, of luck and everything we do right but there's a lot of you have you got to have that opportunity that luck that open door but there has to be that that talent and then that that drive or that the, the yeah. work that you put in and and, and and being 17 years old being driven to actually say hey yeah. i i can't drive but my mom's gonna drive me to yeah. take my flash set that i yeah. drew for you know weeks or whatever and i'm gonna get it done well i worked that this was very short lived, but I remember for a few months I worked at a shop in Orange County and I remember my mom worked in Rancho and she would drop me off at the guy's house who lived in Rancho on her way to work. And then I would commute with him all the way to Orange County and then he would take me back home. And it just so happened to be around the time my mom was getting off. So I did that for a few months, wow. you know, and I'm like 18, you know, so yeah, I went through a lot of like stuff, but it's funny because back then I'm like, man, why didn't I just quit? Because there were so many things going against me. But I was just so excited, man. It was it was like even bad stuff was like, hey, this is still better than where I was. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going and see where this train goes. You know, when when did you know that I got something here and and I'm gonna I'm gonna I did a tattoo and then somebody came up to you that you admired and just said, yeah, kid. That's a good question. I don't think you asked me that. Well, I got my first slice of humble pie at the shop that I ended up spending my. What would I say? Like, were you getting a little big headed? I was, man, okay. because you got to think. Like when I was telling you about that shop I worked at, where all my buds would come over, it was like they're they're all my hype men. They're like, "Yo, this is sick. <laughs> this is dope," you know. So you started to believe the hype, right. you know. And then I remember I got a job in Merino Valley. Right, I go in there and the guy's like, you know, kind of filling me out. He goes, "Oh, do you do do you do flash?" And I, for those who don't know what that is, that's basically if a customer comes in and just picks something off the wall. And I was like, nah, man, I only do my own drawings. I only do custom stuff. And, and I thought that was a good answer. And he was like, that's lame, man. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? He goes, you know, we're here to cater to the clients and you need to be well-rounded. You need to know how to do all styles. Wow. So I was like, oh, okay. Because like, what style were you doing? Um, real cartoony, new school, like everything. Okay. You know, because I, like I said, I came from a comic background. Okay. And then I liked cartooning. You know, and uh, at that at that time, the early two thousands, uh, new school was really huge, was really exaggerated, almost graffiti style. Right, you know, yeah. Graffiti meets tattooing, so that was my thing. And then uh, it was kind of like getting checked from older brothers, you know, because like I went in there with this chip on my shoulder, like like you don't need to treat me like an apprentice because I I've already put a little bit of time in. But what I didn't realize is the time I had put in, I'd learned a lot of bad habits. And I had an ego problem, things like that, you know. 
Um, what great advice, though, right? I yeah. Mean, that he that he said that like you got to be you got to do everything. Yes. You know. Yeah. You get, and my boss. I mean, we're still friends. I just went to his shop and hung out the other day. He's he's like a second father figure to me, man. He taught me so much about life, about tattooing, and just being a man. You know. And I think I'll never forget that for that reason. So it was like, as I was learning how to tattoo, he was helping me become a better human being, you know? And he wasn't even a Christian or nothing like that. He, yeah. just, he was the first dude where I was like, this is a real dude that's not going to lie to you. He's going to tell you how it is. Right. And I wasn't used to that, you know what I mean? I was surrounded by yes men and people hyping me up. And he wasn't afraid to call me out and, you know, tell me how it is. So I think I needed that at that time, you yeah. know what I mean? We and all then, do. um yeah, so I ended up working at that shop in Reno Valley for about seven years. And I think around that time is the time where you're talking about where the confidence was building. It was basically, I thought I was learning how to do things right. And then they kind of broke down all that. It was like break down and then rebuild. It's like, hey, everything you learn, you need to throw it out the window. And I was wow. like, all right. <laughs> you know, like I was kind of bummed. But then I realized what they meant as I started, you know, because I would stand over them, watch them tattoo and things like that. And I realized what I was doing wrong. So then, um, and I started seeing a shift in the way my tattoos were healing, in the way, you know, my colors were, were healing and settling and things like that. So I was like, okay, these guys know what they're talking about. And, I, and honestly, like, I would look at their work, you know, I can sit here and be proud, but like, I would look at their work and my work. And I'm like, well, my stuff's not coming back like that. So I need to listen to these guys. Um, and it was all dudes, you know, and they were all hard on me. And I think, I mean, to be really, there was nights, like I would go like off to another room and cry because i was just not used to getting that tough love you know and i think everyone needs that so i've been around some tattoo shops you know my, my friend uh ab owns a shop yeah and I, I remember you know he he's done a lot of my tattoos and i remember being in his shop and, and his apprentices and he he was he was hard on them i yeah. mean he was hard on them and I, for a second i'm thinking like dude is that, is that necessary yeah but then and you know they would be like all with their head down and go get me food or go do this or yeah. that's not right. You, you're doing it wrong, you know? Yep. And, uh, those two guys became amazing artists, you know? Yeah. And, and there's something to be said about that when, when, when guys are hard on you and, and not going to just get be yes men and tell you what you want to hear. Absolutely. And what's so weird is I don't know how I came upon this realization, but I remember there was one night where I was thinking about quitting. I was like, maybe I'm just not cut out for this. Cause I, I just couldn't handle the ridicule I was getting at work. And then I, I was just sitting there. I was like, why is my boss like always so hard on me? And like, like I felt like it was personal. I was like, this dude just doesn't like me. And then something in me was like, he's going to show me respect when I earn his respect. And I don't know where that came from. So I was like, okay, I see what's happening here. He's telling me what to do. I'm not listening. So therefore he doesn't respect me. So I remember that week going like, all right, I'm going to listen to this dude. And I'm going to, I'm going to earn his respect. I'm going to earn everyone's respect at the shop. Nice. And I swear it must have been a few months later. It was like all their attitudes were different. And that's that's when I learned. I said, okay, they don't give out the respect. You have to earn it. And I think no one ever taught me that, you know? So, and I respected that about it. It's like, you don't just get to walk in here and think you're, you're dope and we're just going to kiss your butt, you know? So it was around that time when they would come in, look over my shoulder and be like, yeah, that's it. That looks good. You know, like, nice. so I'm like, okay, cool. I'm getting somewhere now. So I think it was it was through their tough love and just honestly it was it was brutal day in and day out like the client would leave they're like that look that sucked you know we 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 don't have that too much now yeah and you that's, know what I mean it's, it's a bummer man it's it's kind of sad you know you get guys that they, they'd probably come into a shop now and and get that tough love and just say I'm out of here yeah you know I'm go, I'll go somewhere else you know where where they're not going to do that to me and a lot of times it's it's not because they hate you or they don't like you it's just that they see some talent they yeah. want you to get better. Yeah. And I'm like that with the guys in the gym, you know, I'm like, I'm the old guy now. So I see a yep. young guy come in and I'm like, if you come every day, yeah, if you roll hard, you're going to be good, man. Trust yeah. me right now. You're, you're miserable. You're getting your butt kicked, yeah. but you have a lot of good attributes. There's a lot of good. I can see that you can be in there. And sometimes they scratch their head and they're like, I don't know, man. <laughs> yeah. and I'm, I'm, and, that's crazy. And then you see these guys get their blue belt or something like that. And it's like. I told you, yeah. just keep coming and you're going to be good. But it's funny how that all comes full circle too, like with, with spirituality, with becoming a man, all that. It's like, it's like you, you hear the truth, you know what the truth is and you're like, nah, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not buying it. But then once you finally take that leap and go, all right, I'm going to trust this. And then you see the change in your life. You're like, okay, there's something here, you know? Yeah. Those, those are the hardened men. Right. And I mean that on, and with, in a good way. Yeah. You know, th those are the guys you kind of want on your team. Like they've been through some stuff. 
uh, uh, they didn't have the easy route. They worked hard to get it. They, they went through the ridicule and, and, and yeah. then they came out. You know, I always tell my wife, you know, when, when Cam was a lot younger, you know, he's, he's approaching 21 now. <laughs> yeah. But when he was a lot younger I, I, and my wife, you know, I'd get on him, you know, and yeah. then she would she would, you know, like a good mother. She would try to defend her son or step in a little bit. Yep. And I, I had to tell her time out. I'm raising a man here. Yeah. Like you can baby him to the side. <laughs> yeah. right a little bit but i'm raising a man here so if yeah. i'm hard on him this is what i have to do yeah. to harden him up a little bit you know because yeah. we, we'd have him in the garage boxing and he'd ha- shed a little tear here and there nope leave him alone yep. hey you know oh he's tired you know uh you know he, he had yeah. school last night and then he has to go to work then it's, uh, it's fine yeah it's, it's not gonna be like this forever let's, let's, yeah. let's harden him up a little bit yeah and and you can see now like it's nothing you know, yeah. it, it, it's he's he's a lot stronger, a lot harder than than even some of his friends that are around him. Yeah, absolutely. And I, when I think back on my life, the most valuable moments were found through very difficult or conflict situations. Right. You know I mean, you're not going to learn when like everything's easy. It's it's when you're at rock bottom that you're like, okay, what's going on here? You know. Yeah. So it's like you kind of got to be broken down. You know. So I'm the same way with my kids. You know what I mean? I love them to death. And I remember when I had my daughter, I was like, man, I'm never going to be able to be mean to this sweet little girl. But sometimes you got to be dad. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got to be the dad of the house. <laughs> yeah. So you you got your shop. Yeah. We're going to fast forward a little bit here. Yeah. What, what's the name of your shop, man? Uh, Envision Tattoo. And I'll, 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 I'll give you a quick breakdown. So basically, I was at Paragon Tattoo, which is in Reno Valley, for about seven years. And then around seven years. So how old are you at this time? When you're, when you're paying your dues. Let me see. I started working at that shop when I was like 18. So that's that's pretty young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, I was young. Maybe 19. And then I stopped working there when I was, well, it's about 26, I would say. Because I was there seven years. And I think what, what it was is. So at 26, you almost have 10 years of experience. Yeah. Yeah, which game. is crazy. That's insane, dude. But I will say all all of my inspiration came from my boss. My boss was there, first person to be there, last person to leave. I remember this is a really little little side note, but I remember what do you remember what night they used to play Art Lebeau? Sunday nights. Okay. So everyone would dip out early Sunday nights. Did nights. you used to make a dedication, bro? No, I did. Okay. I like listening to the dedications. Right? <laughs> But the reason I bring that up is because no one wanted to work Sundays, but me and him would would hold it down every Sunday, nice. and that was our thing. You know, we'd, we he'd put Art LeBeau on, and we would tattoo. And I think him and I were on the same wavelength. You know, it was like we just all we knew how to do was work. You know, and I saw his hard work and what it got him. You know, yeah. and then I think after seven years of being there, and you know, contributing financially to the shop. And then seeing that my, you know, my business is growing, it just seemed like the next logical step. It's like, okay, well, what's next from here? And I was like, I think I'm ready to break off and do my own stuff. But again, I got humbled when I did that. So I, I broke off from that shop. Shoot, what year was that? It was probably around like 2012. Yeah, 2012. Because I started tattooing in 05. Which is a gamble for anybody. Yeah, absolutely. And what's so funny is... In situations where most people would be scared, I've always been overly confident, which has sometimes come to bite me. You know what I mean? So I was like, oh, I'm going to open up my own shop. I got business. Like, I'm going to be fine, you know? And he kind of gave me a heads up. Like, hey, dude, like, I understand why you want to leave. But if you think you're going to leave and everything's just going to be perfect and sunshine, you're going to find out. And I remember, like, those first six months of owning a business, calling him like, hey, bro, this happened. What do I do? You know, things like that. Um, trying to get that older brother advice, you know, and and it gave me some appreciation. It's kind of like one day when your son is a dad, he's going to look back and go, oh, OK, I see why. Oh, I can't wait for that. Yeah. Then I'm gonna say, and, I told you. That's all you can do is wait. <laughs> so I think that must have been how it was for him. He was like, he got to watch me go through that growth period, you know, and um, I was not cut out to be a business owner, man. Mm. And I like I just jumped into it green behind the ears and then. Again, it was like starting over. It was like, you know, I, I had to be taken down a few notches and realize like, hey, I know nothing about this, but I just got to be open-minded and learn. And and I did, you know, I learned and I'm still learning, you know. Um, so that was 2012. And then um, and then I officially opened Envision Tattoo in 2013 in Grand Terrace. And then I was at that location, let me see, for about – Five years, I think it was four or five years, and then we opened Envision in Murrieta, California. 
So the reason that one opened was because my wife and I were like, hey, let's move to Marietta. Um, uh, but I was like, I really want to support the community I live in. So I was like, I want my business to be in the same city that I live That's in. That's cool. So um, that way I can give back and do a lot of stuff. And then we opened it. And then... <laughs> I'm still in Mobile now, and it's been open two years. So that's kind of like the goal is to, you know, we plan on moving to Marietta, and, you know, we want to give back to the community and things like that. Um, but I still have the Grand Terra shop. That shop is is still home, dude. Like, I go there, and it's just it, – it's it's like a, a day hasn't passed by when I go there, you know. Right. So because a lot of people are like, why do you have two shops? Why don't you just have one? And it's like I have so many good memories, and the people that work there are like family, and I'm – now I'm building that all over again in Maria. Yeah. You know what I mean. So is it is it hard to find artists? Yes, incredibly because you're letting people in your circle. You know what I mean. A thing that I see that happens all the time in tattooing is people see the dollar signs, and I I'll, I'll get people all the time that aren't even tattooers. They're like, "Yo, man, I'm thinking about opening up a tattoo shop. You guys must make great money." I'm like, "Dude, this is the last business. Like, go open a laundromat. Go do something else." <laughs> Like car wash. Yeah. Even a barber <laughs> shop, like you'll make way more money. Cause one of my buddies, that's a barber. He's like, yeah, I'm thinking about opening a tattoo shop. I'm like, dude, stay, stay where you're at. Cause yeah. if, if you're in this for money, then <laughs> you're going to be disappointed, you know? So, um, yeah, it's hard because you got to find, there's multiple elements to it. They got to be a good dude. They got to be trustworthy. Um, they don't have to be just like you, you know? And that's, what's beautiful about yeah. tattooing. Just like our friendship. It's like, you can be nothing alike, but still get along every day and you know have a lot of things you bring to the table <clears throat> excuse me so i think that that was the hard thing was developing a team of people right you know what i mean so but i'm really happy with the guys i have now and you know the way i look at it is that's a second home and it's like do you trust these people in your home you know are they going to steal right. from you are they going to have drugs around are they going to bring people in that are underage and tattoo you know things like that and unfortunately, there's certain things that you can't foresee happening that happen, you know, but for the most part, up up until now, we've been able to weed out the people very quickly that we knew like, all right, this guy isn't a good fit or this girl, you know, and so I think I'm, I'm really happy with the setup we have now. Do you, do you know right away who's not a good fit? Yeah. And you know what? I, I, I will be honest at the very early stages. It was about the money. It was like, all right, I just need to get someone in here so I can cover the overhead, you know, but then, you know, lessons come with that. It's like, you know, if you're doing it for the money, you also got to realize it's right. going to come with this, you know. So I had to be patient and say, hey, you know, if, if this is going to grow organically and it's going to be a family, you can't force it. You can't rush it. You just got to let things go. So, um, yeah. I, and what's funny is everyone that has been a bad seed that's come in, we all spot it very quickly. Yeah. Like one of the guys will pull me aside and be like, hey, I don't, you know, I don't like this dude or this. And, and they're not doing it for any other reason than they're looking out for the shop, which is cool. You know what I mean? And one thing about tattooers, you, you deal with so many different people while you're tattooing them. You kind of get, I mean, hip to the game of, you know, okay, I I, yeah. I, I know so many people. I kind of interact with a lot of people. I can, you know, not in a bad way, but just in a way of you, you're constantly interacting with people. You, you know what's what, who's yeah. who, who's playing games, right? Exactly. And the cool thing is the community is small. So if, if someone comes to me for a job, I'll usually ask around like, hey, have you heard of so-and-so? Is there anything I should know? Right. You know, things like that. And um, something that I had to learn is like, you know, something my wife pointed out earlier in our marriage. She goes, she goes, you see the good in everybody. And I'm like, I, I just try to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Even if there's huge red flags, like I want to like give them a shot. And she's like, I think that's good, but you got to know where to draw the line. You know yeah. what I mean? So there's been times when it came to hiring she goes, do you really like this person or are you just trying to see the good in them? I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, so I got to take a step back. So Especially when when overhead's involved, right? Yeah, and it's – and you can't do it for the overhead because there has been times where I've been kind of conflicted. Like, ah, oh, well, you know, this would really help us out with the bills. But at the same time, it's like I got other guys – they become like your kids, man. Like it's like, it's like do I want to put this person in our family that's going to then affect – everyone else you know because right. i have a loyalty to my other guys too you know yeah so that's pretty dope, i think about man. the big picture so 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 last year um i know you you were kind of vocal about it on uh on your instagram and i know we we text a little bit about it but you kind of had i know you mentioned earlier on in in your teenage years you had like an, an anxiety um issue in your life yeah um and then last year you had met, I seen that and I was like, man, what's going on? Cause I know you weren't tattooing. 
um you weren't going to the shop you know yeah. um what was going on there man it's funny because a lot of people ask me they're like what caused that and I, I couldn't tell you man but i would say leading up to that point i was lost man just uh all around i was saying yes to everything i was more booked than i could have ever been or ever been i was so like driven by money and like success and just social media like i was turning into a monster man to be honest like it was almost like i lost a part of who i was and i was chasing so many things and i think what was happening is those things i was chasing was making me feel empty so then i would chase more and more and more so i think what happened is my body finally just was like yo you've had too much and um basically what happened i could tell you exactly what happened it was uh i think it was like october of 19 uh, my wife came down to get tattooed and I had a buddy of mine from Georgia guest spotting. My wife, my wife and I got done tattooing. We went to go to Red Robin to have some food. And then right when we got in the car, I started feeling dizzy and like sweaty. I'm like, whoo, I was like, what's going on? And, you know, so immediately I'm like, maybe it's something I ate. You know, I started feeling weird. And then the whole drive, I'm like, it got the air on. I'm like, man, I don't, I'm not feeling so hot. And then, um, the whole drive there, my wife's like, are you okay? I'm like, I think so. I was like, I just, I've never felt like this before, you know? So then we're sitting, uh, waiting to be called to the table. And I was like, I was like, man, I feel like I'm going to pass out right now, you know? And then we're sitting there and she's like, maybe you just need some food. Maybe your blood sugar is low, you know? So as I'm sitting there eating, I kept going up to the bathroom, splashing water on my face. And my wife's like, what's going on? With you? I was like, I don't know. I was like, I feel shaky. Like almost like, you know, like if you've drinking like two cups of coffee and you feel jittery, I was like, I don't know what's going on. I was like, but I feel like I'm going to pass out. And then um, she was like, do you want to leave? She's like, you're not touching your food. That's not like you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. I was like, because I tried eating food, nothing. And then um, on on the way out of that parking lot, I had my first panic attack. And I had heard of panic attacks. I just thought. Panic so you had never had one before? No. no. Wow. And like I'd heard the phrase, never thought twice about it. You know, I've had anxiety my whole life where I'd be anxious and on edge, but. I had my first panic attack and I freaked out, freaked my wife out. And I was like, you got to call 911. She's like, what's it? Cause I thought I was dying. That's what everyone thinks. They're like, I'm having a heart attack. So, so what's happening? Your chest, your chest can't breathe. Yeah, You feel like sweat. you can't breathe. Uh, everything comes, everything gets like kind of blurred vision. Um, you feel like you're dying. Like literally, like, I can't, I can't describe it. It feels like your body is shutting down. And the more you're like, thinking about it the worst it makes it so like because i didn't know what was going on like my flight or flight response or fight or flight response was just triggered to the roof so i ended up telling my wife i said uh, i had her pull over i said call call the ambulance i was like something i was convinced i was dying you know and i've talked to a lot of people who've had panic attacks and said the first one is always like that because wow. until you've experienced one you don't realize it you know and i'd never met anyone who'd had one so the ambulance gets there. They're like, what's going on? <laughs> you know, I'm just like, I don't know, bro. I'm dying, you know? And then they're like, all right, we'll take you in, you know? And and they didn't seem too worried about it. And then I went to the hospital. They checked all my vitals. Everything was cool. And of course I calmed down. So I went home that day and I'm like, dude, what was that? Like that, that was weird. Cause they didn't tell me at the hospital that I had a panic attack. They're wow. like, they're like, dude, you're healthy, man. Like you're good. So the next day I woke up and went for a run and I'm like, and I'm like going for a run and I, and, and I fainted while I was running and then oh, I thought it was because of the heat because it was like 100 degrees out so it like shook me up again I was like I, I remember I walked home because I was at the track by my house so I, I walked home and I was like dude what's going on and then the next day at the gym I was in the middle of the gym same thing happened I, I felt like I was gonna pass out went to the bathroom started splashing water on my face and then it kind of built from there. So basically the way it developed into disorder is I was having multiple panic attacks, right? And there's people in life who will have a panic attack and then carrying on with laughter. It's like, whoa, that was scary. What was that? Well, I was having them so consecutively that I started to think something was wrong with me. And then I stopped doing things. So basically what happens with, with what I had, which is called agoraphobia, is basically you are so fearful that you're going to have a panic attack in public that you just stop going places. So the fear of having a panic attack is yes, agoraphobia. you're in constant fear. So like the best way I describe it, because most people that have no idea, because I mean, everyone has anxiety to an extent, right? But when you yeah. have an anxiety disorder, the way I describe it to people is like, if you've ever been in your car and you almost get in a car accident and your heart's racing and you got chills everywhere, you feel like that constantly. Ooh. Yeah, it's terrible. And it's, it's, 
That's an ugly feeling, man. Because if, if if you almost get in a car accident, it, it stays with you the rest of that ride. It, yes. It, you're just like. <sighs> yeah. And the problem is, is when you feel like that, you can't help but question it. You know what I mean? Because I remember when I was first going through it, all my buddies were like, dude, just go to the gym or just pray about it. I'm just like, bro, I've tried it, man. Like, you know what I mean? And I didn't realize. So they have this thing that's called cognitive behavioral therapy. So basically the disorder is developed through unhealthy thought patterns you know i basically had convinced myself that if i go and do these things something bad will happen because the past has showed me that so basically that's how your brain develops this disorders you know you, you'll be like oh i need to go get some from the grocery store and then your brain goes well, what if you have a panic attack and then just that thought you start getting sweaty your heart starts racing yeah so it's almost like that you know your 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 nervous system and your brain are now kind of battling each other you know it's it's so crazy because i talked to a friend about that and and he's he's very successful guy like yourself and and he had those issues too and and i said what is it and he says well it it can be spiritual but a lot you know as a believers right away they go to that right oh it's a spiritual thing which it can be of course and then he was like or it can be a chemical imbalance yeah or it can you know just be a, a critical way of thinking yeah and and you know, my, my wife, she, she's okay with me talking about this, but she went through that for a little while where she was depressed and, and, the she went to one therapy session and, and kind of like what you're saying where it was about her thinking. Yeah. And when it was, a, when she understood that, Hey, this is the way I'm thinking yeah. and this is not the right way to think. And I have, I have the power to kind of control this a little bit yeah. and I can, I can recognize it and understand it. She said, and then she kind of like, was like, okay. Yeah. Like just the understanding of it. Yeah. And the the thing with me is it took me a lot longer than I thought to get through it. So, you know, because my wife is like, you know, you went through this as a teenager, so that should give you hope. Like you got through that, you'll get through this again. But I think because it was a different type of disorder that I was just like, you know, just kind of questioning everything. I was like, you know, is is God allowing this to happen for a reason? Yeah. You know, did I, did I cause this? You know, so... The first year that I took off of just not tattooing and things was really just self-evaluating and getting a lot of dumb advice from so many different people. I mean, that's just how it is. Everyone wants to help you, which, yeah, you know, a lot of people meant well. Meant well, yeah. Yeah. Shake it off. You're fine. But yeah, it, it, it pretty much it pretty much knocked over my foundation and my thinking, and I had to start from scratch with everything, with my spirituality. Because, I mean, as a man, right? Yeah. A father, you know, a, a business over you're, you're the, you're the alpha in your, in yeah. your surroundings. And for men, it's hard to really admit those things or, yeah. or, or to ask for help. Right. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're notorious, right? We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll drive for hours and not get directions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, and I think honestly, it, for me, it was just figuring out what it was and how to fix it. You know what I mean? Cause I was getting, You know, I I would get people that are like, bro, you just got to pray every day, you know, and I was obviously, but, you know, you also got to realize this is a medical thing too. Um, And it's something that has to be worked out, um, whether it's through therapy or just like how your wife was saying, you know, it's, it's, it's bad thought patterns that you have or things like that. So, man, I mean, shoot, I had anxiety driving over here. So I think the thing that I would tell people because I just wanted to wake up one day and it all be gone, like no anxiety. But the unfortunate side is when you have an anxiety disorder, you're always going to kind of have it. You just have to learn yeah. to cope with it and not feed it and things like that. So I think that's where I'm at right now is is like I, I recognize when I'm doing things that are making it worse. And then I try to like think, OK, what are some unhealthy patterns I've had lately? You know, like if I'm feeling depressed or whatever. Now I can kind of recognize things I'm doing and things like that. So, but the funny thing, Dave, is I've been like that as long as I can remember, man. Like I remember as a kid, I would just sit and think about super heavy, deep stuff. And I'd come to my mom with it. She's like, why are you thinking about that already? Like you're young, you know? So I think I've often heard that like both creative and like really smart people, your brain just kind of works at a different level as far as like, you're just a really deep, passionate thinker. And I think, it's a mixture of that. And I think a lot of it is psychological too, man, is I think, you know, there's some un unworked out stuff from a childhood. I mean, I had a good childhood. I'm not going to say that, but I think there was some dysfunction from my childhood 
that's kind of worked its way into like who I am as a person. And I think that's where a lot of my drive, as I got older, I realized, you know, what is it about myself that's so unrelenting with wanting to be successful and wanting, you know, to achieve all these goals? Because there would be times my wife would be like, what are you doing this all for? You know what I mean? She's like, you want more, but you have it all, you know? And I remember having to ask myself that question, not knowing the answer, you know, and that's, that's when I knew it was a problem. I was like, you know what? She's right. So I think that time off really allowed me to evaluate, okay, what are priorities, you know, in my life? And, you know, she even told me, she goes, it's good that you're ambitious. She's like, don't change who you are, but you need to do it in a healthy way. So I think that's what that time off really gave me was to evaluate, you know, who I am as a father, who I am as a believer, as a business owner. And the other thing is so much of my identity was wrapped up in my work. And you see that a lot with guys who retire, you know, like they retire and they're like, well, what do I do now? Oh, yeah. Like that was my life. And I think I got a taste of that early, you know, it was like as soon as tattooing was taken from me, I was super depressed because that was my value. That was my identity. So it's like, without that, who am I? So I always I, tell guys that too, that like you need some sort of other outlet. Yeah. You know, if it's just all about whatever it may be, you know, your passion, uh, work, um, your talent, you know, sports, whatever you need something to offset that yeah, a little bit. Maybe, maybe it's music or something like that. Like I had a friend, he's a great designer, great guitar player. We, we used to play music together and stuff. And, um, you know, he was just like, I go, you, you need something else, bro. Yeah. You, you, go, go to the gym, yeah. try jujitsu or try, you know, going to the gym. You, you need something else. Cause you're so wrapped up in, in your stuff. And you're not really, you need something else. You yeah. know, I always found that with myself. I, I need something else, you know, did music that faded out. And then I, w- I would be like, I would have this, like, where's my, what do I have? Yeah. You know? And then I was like, Lord, can you, can you give me something else? <laughs> yeah. You know? And then I had the passion for the brand and I'm yeah. doing the brand thing and, you know, and I'm making shirts and it's fun and da, 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 da. And then that starts dying down. And I'm like, Okay. Yeah. Uh, what? What now? And now, yeah. you know, Lord, can you can you give me something else? It's it's weird how men are like that. We yeah. need something to, to 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 fill that little gap right there sometimes. And I see it. You know, ever since I've done it, you know, I, I I took that time off to really dig deep. I see it so much. Is like you know, we're all searching for something. You know, everyone's searching for happiness, and and I, and I think that's okay. The pursuit of happiness is okay, but I think when you're when you're putting all your value and your happiness on things that don't matter, then that becomes a problem. You know what I mean? And I think that's why people go to God is because, you know, you're trying to fill this God sized hole in your heart and it's, that's the only thing that can fill it, you know? But a lot of people think, Oh, that means you got to go to church every day. It's like, no, it's just like, he needs to be a center point of your life, but you can still, I can still be Jake, the tattoo artist, the family man, but God needs to be, there needs to be a structure there. And I think when all this started, I was just off the rails, man. You know what I mean? I was just chasing so many things. Because you had a lot of success, right? I did, but it was never enough. And I see it. I see it all the time now. Like, I'll see, you know, actors, celebrities that are like, you know, they get to this status point and they're like, it's not enough. And then yeah. it's like, you know what I mean? So that's something I had to realize is and through my wife. Thank God I got a good wife, you know, and she would be like, when's it going to be enough? You know, like you have two beautiful kids. You have me. And I was like, dang, you shop, know, you yeah. have, you, you're shop, you're known. I mean, I, I used to say that all the time about you. I was like, this this guy, you know, I, I would see people with their traditional tattoos and, and no diss to anybody out there. But I would say, Jake's the the best that I've seen. Thanks, man. Like, like, like he's the best. And so, you know, when you say that, it's, it's hard for me to comprehend that because it's yeah. just like you were there. You yeah. know what I mean? Like you you had it. You're, you're, you're just rolling. Yeah. And then boom. I think sometimes, uh, you know, a lot of people get will get freaked out about this, but I think sometimes God, God kind of like pulls us back down to to yeah. earth a little bit, right? Yeah. And, and I, there's probably was some warning signs there. There's oh a, yeah, he I always, ignored all of them. He always gives us some red flags there and says, "Hey, yeah. uh, listen, I'm right here." And then you know, all of a sudden we get punched in the in the throat, and then we're like, "Okay, I'm sorry." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> honestly, man, there were so many times throughout that learning process that God showed up and was just like, just humbled me, man. Because I, you know, when, when everything was stripped away from me, it was like, I felt like nothing, you know? And it's like, to me, it's like that, that was unsettling, you know, it's like, I should be confident in who I am as a husband, as a father. And that should, that should be sufficient enough. But I think so much of 
my value was placed in what I what I did for work mm-hmm. and things like that and trying to please people and things like that. And that's where I think to a point it comes I think it comes back to like my childhood, you know, watching my mom struggle and things like that or like seeing the things we couldn't have because, you know, the lack of money is I think that that gave me a drive from a young age to do it. But as I got older, it's like, okay, you know, what are you chasing here? You know, it's yeah. good to be ambitious, but if you're doing it for the wrong reasons or if it becomes unhealthy, then you got to pull it back a little bit. The, the, the old story of the gift and the curse, right? Yeah, you know absolutely. what I mean? I mean, I, I think people that are talented, um, you know, we see that they're so super talented and you see these actors or these musicians and they, and you're, and you're thinking to yourself, you know, they, they commit suicide and you're yeah. thinking, they have everything. Yeah. They, they, they have it all, but there, there's something still missing in their life, right? Yeah. There's this, there's this gap that there's hole they, they can't fill and they try to fill it with success, money, you know, just, just wanting more and more, but yeah. it's never enough. And it's funny because I've heard and seen that story so many times and I always love it. You know, like you hear the, you know, the washed up rock star or whatever that's chasing it. And I, and I see it all around me on Instagram and stuff, but I think we live in a world where there's so many distractions that you don't even have enough time to recognize when you're in it. And that was me. I was so deep in it and I didn't realize it. And I had no one except for my wife. My wife was subtly kind of nudging at me like, Hey, you okay? Like, like I see what you're doing and I just want to make sure. Okay. And it wasn't until I hit rock bottom that I was like, oh, okay, there is a problem here. You know what I mean? And it's funny how you bury yourself, you know, like how you're saying, like with your buddies, it's like you you give so much of your time and sometimes you're doing it and you're like, am I even happy doing this? Yeah. But you're just kind of like in autopilot, just doing it. And I think that's where I was at is I was just saying yes to everything and just more and more and more and more until finally like my mind and my body were just like, you're done, man. You got to take a break. So. It's a, it's such a good um, thing to learn yeah. when you have younger kids too, right? Yeah, because the the years go by fast. I see your kids; they're they're just yeah, dude. I'm like, what the heck? They're growing up, yeah. growing up, getting getting older, and and then to learn that early and just to say, okay, pause. Yeah, what's what's important? They're only going to be in elementary for you know a few years, and then it's yeah. on to junior high, and then before long, they're doing their own thing, and and you'll never have that time back. Yeah. Right. You, you never have those moments back and you can get so wrapped up in, in everything and then lose out on 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 everything. Yeah. That makes sense. It makes perfect sense. And what's funny is like how we're talking about God working. So many clients would say little nuggets of truth. Like at times I needed to hear them the most. And I always trip out. I'd go home and be driving like, man, I feel like God wanted me to hear that because it would just they would say something that fit perfect to whatever I was going through at that time. And I remember one of my clients had told me that, you know, we were talking about work and stuff. And he had told me he had just stopped working overtime. I was like, oh, why'd you do that? He goes, I realized I was investing into my retirement and not my kids. He's like, but I realized that the time with my kids have the greatest return. And I was just like, bro, that hit me like a ton of bricks. You know, I was like, my kids, I love them, but I'm not giving them nearly as much time as I am these other things. And when I'm old. You know, what am I going to have all that stuff? No, I, I want my wife. I want my kids. I want right. the things that matter. So I think it's just funny how the signs are all around you, but we have our blinders on, you know, or there's things that happen and you just, you let it go in one ear out the other. So I think it's been cool seeing the way God lets things happen and opens your eyes. And you're like, it's kind of funny because you talked about earlier how you had your boss and you had these guys that were, you know, you're apprenticing under and uh you know they were hard on you and it got you to where you are right in your yeah. success and and kind of we're still like apprentices under god till the day we die right yeah and we still get these lessons and sometimes he's, he's a little hard on us yeah. right because he's like hey i love you you know I, I i have to teach you this lesson because you're not doing it right and if i gotta break you all the way down like your yeah your old tattoo guy did then then, then that's what he does and it got to that point. I mean, to be honest with you, I uh, I got a little scared during last year because I, I told my wife, I said, hey, I said, I don't know if I want to live anymore. And mm-hmm. like that, that really was hard for me to admit. But I just, I just told her, I said, I got to tell someone. And at no point did I actually consider taking my life. But I just remember just talking to God like, hey, like I'm, I'm broken. I don't know what you want for me from my life. And I, I slowly just went from there, you know, just praying about it and just, you know, talking with people and just 
really being upfront, open. And that's, that's around the time I started being vocal about it online and just telling people like, Hey man, like don't let my life fool you. Like I'm jacked up. Like this is what's going on. And I, I'm trying to get better, you know, because I know there's tons of people that are in the same boat, you know, like chasing the wrong things and, you know, and, and especially me, like I knew better, but still I just was like, Nope, you know, I gotta, I gotta. And I think that's the power that social media and things play is you get caught in that rat race of like trying to keep up with the Jones and things like that. Yeah. But the reality is if I stop tattooing tomorrow, I got everything I need at home, man. Like I got a good wife, amazing kids, but I was so wrapped up in all those things. So it's, it's, it's hard to admit that man. It, it is. It, 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 it's really hard to, to, and then to find somebody that you can kind of like confide in and say, you know, because as men, we don't want to, we don't want to tell our wives yeah. that. And, and my wife yeah. always tells me, I need to know what's going on with you yeah. because, and, and, and she nailed it on the head the other day. And I go, I don't like to tell you sometimes yeah. what's going on in my mind because I don't want you to worry. It's my job to protect you. You know what she told me? She says, I need to know what's going on because I need to know what to pray for. Ah, that's awesome. And I was like, yo, and it, yeah. that just pierced my heart. Like, okay. Yeah. Like. You know, of course, there's always things we protect our wives about, you know, and we, and we have a covering yeah. over them. But there is some times when we, we really have to have, you know, her. And then if we can't tell her, we have to find some other somebody else to really say, hey, man, you know, I need some help here. You know, it's, yeah. it's hard to find that. A lot of guys, what I learned, they don't have that. Yeah. They don't have that in their life. And, you know, and, and bad things usually happen when they don't yeah. have that in their life. Yeah, it's know? unfortunate. It's, it's just so funny. Like something I noticed with me is. I would often look for answers from everyone else but my wife. She would always be the last person I come to. And I think that was because I knew I didn't want to hear what she had to say because I knew that it was truth, you know? Yeah. And But now I've since told her, like, you know, thank you. Thank you for telling me not what I wanted to hear but what I needed to hear. You and know? who knows you the best? My wife. Yeah, right? Yeah, it's she, crazy. Huh? Yeah, she would tell me. She'd be like, cut the BS. Like, <laughs> I, I know, you know, because she would see me say certain things. She's like, that's not you. Like, don't do that. You know what I mean? So... I love that about her. And I think, you know, you talk about accountability in church. You need that throughout your entire life. You need someone holding you accountable to a certain standard. And I think my wife is that for me. So Right. Well, yeah. We don't have somebody that we're accountable to. And that that goes for everything, right? I mean, work, you know, the Lord especially, though, you know, in church and God and our relationship with him. Uh, when we don't have that, you know, it just kind of, we just kind of wander, man. And it's it's not how it was meant to be. Yeah. It's not how it was meant to be. And that's, that's, it's so, it's, it's one thing to grow up going to church and things like that. But what I loved about 2020 was no matter what I went through, it always pointed me back to the Bible. Like there was nothing I went through good or bad that there wasn't something in the Bible that was like, okay, this is what the Bible's talking about, man. Like if you would just listen or pay attention and not be so focused on like trying to be a cult, being a part of today's culture, you would have you would have understood these things, you know. So that's one thing I would say I took away from a lot of it is that like people that are struggling in life, I understand if you don't read the Bible or go to church, but those answers can be found in the Bible. You know what I mean? And I'm totally. thankful because that's where I would get. I, I would hit rock bottom, and then be like, wh- "Where do I go, God?" And then you know, I would think of a verse, or even people would send me verses, bro. I would break down in tears because there'd be a day like during 2020 where I would have something I was troubled with. And then randomly someone I haven't talked to in a while was like, Hey bro, thinking about you, check out this verse. And I would just start weeping. I'm like, how did this dude know that I needed to hear those exact words? You know what I mean? So it's pretty awesome when you open your heart and your mind to those things. You know, I mean, it's easy to read those verses when everything's good, right? (laughs) (laughs) Right. That's so true. Those verses are so easy to read, but then when you really, when you're going through it and you, and and you open up the Bible, you know, and like, for me, it's like, it's, it's in John, you know, and he says, you know, I tell you these things so that in me, you will have peace in this world. You have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Yeah. You know, oh yeah, that's cool. I'm, I'm doing good right now. I'm I'm yeah. on vacation. Yeah, this, a is cool a great scri- <laughs> this is a great scripture. Yeah, yeah. I'll put that on a shirt. You know, yeah. let me put this little quote on my caption. Yeah, you know man. what I mean. But when you're going through that and you read it and you're like and you really get deep into that, I'm telling you this thing so that me you will have peace in this world you have trouble. He's telling us you're gonna there's gonna be some problems, right? Yeah. But but in me you're gonna have peace. Take heart. I have overcome the world. That's so awesome. And so I I it's funny because you can. When, yeah, when things are uh, 
going good. It's it's cool to read the Bible. You yeah. know what I mean? And you, and you read it nonchalant. Those ah, it's great scripture. God bless. Yeah. You know. But when you're <laughs> yeah. going through it and you read that, it's like, dang man. It yeah, got right there. It gets you, man. That's that's one thing I you know losing my pops this year. It, it was really hard, but I just think, man, like. I'm so stoked that he gave me that foundation, you know, because there's been so many times in life that I've drifted away or just had no interest in 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 hearing what God has to say. But then it was like the stuff he taught me would show back up in my life. And I'm like, how cool is that, you know? Did that put you into a funk again? You know what? It's funny. Um, my wife and a few people that were close to me, they were like, they're like, what's up with you? Because they all felt like it did, like I handled it really well. And to be honest with you, Dave, I think what it was is my dad was so excited for heaven wow. his whole life. Like as long as I've known him, he's he he was very clear about I know where I'm going, I'm just passing through. Nice. That I had this sense of peace when he died. You know, he he was in a lot of he had a lot of health issues, things like that. I mean, I wish he wouldn't have gone, you know, by COVID and that way, you know, but I think what this last year taught me was if you get so focused on the negative you're just going to make yourself miserable, right. you know? So I try, I try to take a step back and go, okay, what are the positives? Not to say like, Oh, is what's the positive things about my dad dying, but what are, what are the things that I can take away from this? You know? And I, and I took a lot from my dad's life. You know, he was a simple man, had no cares in the world other than serving Jesus. And he was always that guy that showed up when I was at a dark place and he would always have something that I needed wow. to hear. So it was like, that's all he'd want. Like if he was here in yeah. this room, he'd be like, I'm happy with what I left you. You know what I mean? And that's, you know, it's going to stay with me for the rest of my life. I'm going to pass it on to my kids. So I think it was a learning lesson for me in today's day and age. We get so focused on our legacy or like all these things we want to acquire or leave behind. It was like my dad left me behind with foundation that can't be replaced by anything else. And I think I really admired that. You know what I mean? So that's so, that's so crazy, man, that that mindset. I've been trying to get that mindset for the last few months of just sticking that in my head where I had a guest, Bill Hall, and I shared this plenty of times with other guests here. He came on the show, and he's just so heaven-minded. Yeah. That's where I'm going. And he told he told us, you know, me and the kids after the show, he said, you know what, we're we're just passing through. Yeah. This is a layover. Yeah. I'm landing here. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to try to love people. I'm going to try to tell as many people about Jesus. And it's going to be some issues in this life, but I'm looking to, to, yeah. to, to the afterlife. You know, yep. I'm looking to heaven. And, you know, I think when he says that, you know what I mean? And it, it does put a joy and a peace in my heart. My father died yeah. too. This year will be 20 years. Yeah. And uh, still, it still hurts, you know, and, but I think of the people that God's put in my life that I'm able to help through that or share with them that. And, and, and to be able to know that, you know, there, there is some good. There's some good left in me. You know, Cam was just a baby when he passed. But there's a lot of my dad in him. And I'm sure, yeah. like, there's oh, things yeah. that your dad and your kids that you see. And, yeah. and the, 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 my crazy daughter and the way she jokes around, they, they would have they been crazy. That's where she gets that from. And... But the legacy of of Christ in our heart, you know, that the, the change that he made in his life that affected generations that he, he'll never see, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's uh it's something great and to behold that one day we'll we'll, we'll all be together again and, yeah. and and this life will just be a a, a blink and <laughs> yeah, our success, whatever it may be, yeah. right, is 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 nothing to heaven, you know. It's 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 yeah. a great thing to have, but it's it's really it's really nothing in the, yeah. in the grand scheme of things. And it is hard to live heavenly minded in today's day and age. There's so many distractions, and yeah. I think that was the takeaway from my father's death. It put things back into perspective. It was like, oh, okay, you know, that time I had with my dad came and went so fast, and I'm gonna be on that bed one day. And it's like when I look back. What's going to matter? Is it the stuff that matters to me now? Like, probably not. So it's like, as you grow older, you kind of prioritize and start to learn the things that actually matter. It makes a big difference. It does, man. And it's 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 cool to go through that and have kids. You know what I mean? Even going through what I went through last year, like, I'm, I'm glad that my kids got to see me go through that and work through that. You know what I mean? Because there may come a day when they go through something hard, you know, and they're going to see the way I handled it and be like, hey, 
you know, or they might even things I did wrong. They might be like, ah, oh, you know, my dad did that way. I'll do it this way. You know, we always want our kids to do better than we did. You know, so but they'll be, and, and then you're gonna. It's funny when we go through those things, right? And I always ask God, you know, I, I ask God for a long time, why did this, you know, why did these things happen, or why did the, why did that happen, or why did this happen? And every trial that I've been through, every hardship that I've had, uh, it seems like God sends me somebody that that went through that hardship, yeah, or, or somebody that I can share, you know, hey, you know, this is how I dealt with it, or this is how I, I made it through. You can do it. Yeah, you know, and 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 give them some advice. I I, I don't think every any trial it goes unwasted. Yeah, you know, any hardship goes unwasted. Oh, I don't think so either. Right? And and I, and I was trying to have that mindset because I was listening to a lot of sermons while I was going through it. And it's one thing to like to think it, but actually wholeheartedly believe it. And I kept trying to do that. You know, I was listening to a lot of Greg Laurie, and he talked about turning your mess into a message. And then you know, one thing he said from Chuck Smith was that everything is preparation for something else. You know, and I, I like that because I feel like it's easy to look back on the hard stuff in your life and be like, oh yeah, I see why that happened. But when you're in it and you're going through it, you know, and 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 I I try I kind of did have a shift halfway through it. instead of focusing on okay, what are the things I don't have is just focus on okay, what are all the great things in my life right now? And I think when I held on to that. I started seeing a huge change in like the way I felt, you know, cause when you hold on to the things that you think you don't have, or why is God allowing this and kind of shift your perspective? I think that changed a lot for me. That's so good, man. Yeah. So that's awesome, bro. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you this. Yeah. I know I'm a jump. I jumped. That was great. But I wanted to ask you this as a Christian, is it hard being a tattoo artist? Absolutely. Right. I, I, I Absolutely. and I mean that because I mean, let's just face the facts here. I mean, you, you can have a very good looking woman that wants a tattoo in a, an awkward place. Let's just say, yeah. right. You know, I have a lot of tattoo friends and yeah. some of them I'm sure enjoy that. But I mean, as a Christian man, I mean, it, it's gotta be tough. It's extremely tough, man. And it's funny be- that you brought that up because, you know, oh, man, my wife's so awesome. Like we, we, we set boundaries, right? Because there was a time in our relationship or pretty much anything went as far as what I tattooed, as long as obviously it wasn't like their private areas. But then I, you know, there would be times where say I was doing nothing wrong, but the girl would be like making moves, you know, and, and I would always be transparent with my wife. I'd be like, Hey, you know, I tattooed this girl today. I'm a little bummed because she said this and this she kind of crossed the line. So then we kind of figured out what our boundaries were. And I had a girl, <clears throat> I think it was last year. She was like, hey, I want to get my booty cheeks tattooed. And I, I was like, oh, I don't tattoo girls' butts. And she, like, made fun of me. She was like, why? I was like, just out of respect for my wife. Like, we have boundaries. And she was like, that's lame. Like, if I have money and, I, and I'm just like, you don't understand what kind of can of worms it opens. Like, and honestly, I don't want to be like, even if my wife was cool with it, like, it's just bad news. Like, it's like you're getting close to fire, but expecting not to get burnt. It's like, I don't even want to get myself that right. close. You know what I mean? Uh, But it's hard, man. It's hard. And I can see why people get caught up in it, like the money side of it, the women um, just being corrupted by bad company. Like there's so many things. Have I gotten caught up at times? Yes. Luckily, it hasn't gotten to the point where it's, you know, ruined my marriage or anything like that. But my wife ain't dumb. She knows, you know, she'll just she'll kind of call me out on it. But it never goes away, man. Like there's there's always going to be beautiful women. There's always going to be. There's always going to be things trying to wreck your life, man. Right. You know what I mean? You just got to recognize those things and not have your blinders on and just go, hey, is this worth a couple hundred bucks, like jeopardizing my marriage? Or do I just say no, you know? And there's been times that I've literally been torn and I'll go to my wife, like, check it out. This girl wants a chest tattoo. I'm really hyped on the tattoo idea. But in my ignoring the rest of it, she goes, I think it's a bad idea. You know what I mean? So it's like, I still go to her for advice at times. And I have buddies that are like, oh, my wife don't trip. She don't care. I'm like, good for you, man. Like, yeah, I, I'd rather have boundaries and have my marriage than have a couple extra hundred bucks in my bank account. But it took a very long time for me to realize that cause in the early days, I was like, oh, why is my wife tripping? You know, but it's like the simple thing comes down to those. If the tables were turned, would you want them doing that? Right. And the answer is always no. It's right. like, I wouldn't want my wife. All up in some dude's junk. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's just insane. Tattooing scenario. the inner thigh. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? So I think, I don't know. It's, I, I'm so thankful for what I have now. And I think to push it, you know what I mean? Like any dude's going to be stoked to be around a beautiful woman, you know, if they're half clothed, whatever, like you're human, you know what I mean? But 
if I choose not to even put myself in that situation, then it's like, that's good for me. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, mean, I don't want to be, I mean, there's gotta be some boundaries on your marriage. Like you said, that's number one. Your salvation is up there. You know, just, just having those things in your mind, you know, the, the, you know, let's just face the facts. There's, there's all kinds of thoughts that just creep into your head, you know, when you put yeah. yourself in those positions. And it's it's better not to even do that, you know, and, and just yeah. to say, hey, I'm 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 straight. Well, and the bummer. That and then I you're think, successful, so you can pick and choose now. Okay, yes. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and it, it's, it's weird because, too, you I mean, you can manipulate people. Like, when you're in a certain scenario, like, you know, you can manipulate people and, like, kind of use it to your advantage and – you know, I, I don't want to do that. But the other thing too is that I think I'm trying to think of a way to word this. It's I'm just happy with how things are, man, and I don't want to jeopardize that. Yeah. You know, and I think today's society, they're like, oh man, like hot chick, you know, hooking up with hot chicks and this and that. But it's like, if you tell your guys like, no, I don't want to do that. Like, I want to honor my wife and stuff. Like, in a room full of tattoos, you're like, <laughs> you know, like they're right. gonna laugh at you. So. I think that's tricky, but you know, there's been times that people have asked me like, Hey, why don't you tattoo like, you know, breasts or things like that? And I'll, and I'll tell them why they're like, that's cool. I respect that. But then you get those guys that are like, that's whack, dude. Why don't your wife trust you? I'm like, it has nothing to do with trust, man. It's just, it's respect, man. Yeah. It's definitely respect. It is respect. And I think that's just how it is in tattooing. There's some things that you have to, I mean, just like being a Christian, there's certain things you have to just stick to your guns and know, like I might get ridiculed for this or whatever, but so be it. Yeah. the bottom line is you go home and and you get under the covers with your wife. Yes. You go to sleep with her. You wake up with her. She's taking care of your children. You're with her. I mean, it, yeah. it, it makes all the sense to make sure that that's what remains happy. Yeah. Because in the long run, it's not going to be those guys at the shop that's taking care of you. Yeah. It's not even going to be your kids probably taking care of you. It's going to be that yeah. woman taking care of you. So We had a pastor that actually did our marriage counseling because the guy who married us, he said that he won't marry us unless we did like marriage counseling, you know? And he said that to me and it stuck with me. He goes, at the end of your life, it's you and your wife. He's like, just remember that. So everything that you prioritize above your wife, none of that's going to matter when it's just you guys sitting in bed. Good advice. And I was like, I don't know why that stuck with me. Like from that day, I was like, he's right. My kids are going to grow up. They're going to leave gonna- all the people that get tattooed. All that's going to go away. And I'm going to have to sit. And, and you see it with, with a lot of, people who've been married a long time where the, you know, the dad is distracted by work and the mom's distracted by oh, yeah. raising the kids. And then when all that goes out the window and that, like I was telling you, me getting lost with my identity, I didn't want to it happen. It's like, I wanted my identity to be in my family and in God. So that way, when all that stuff, if it was to be taken away or goes away, we still have something, you know? So yeah, my, my adult children still, still live with us. Right. But they're, they're gone. They're, they work They're They're, yeah. 40 hours a week they're with their friends they're they're out and about and i think there was a i think it was the in 2019 i think we were kind of just finding ourselves alone every weekend yeah you know it was me and her just eating and we 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 were a close family we eat dinner like you like you guys yeah. you know you we eat at dinner together every night and you know we're always together park this that museums whatever it may be but they started doing their own thing and i think it was like a good like month and it was like we were eating dinner by ourselves, me and her, yeah. and we we're having a great time. And I looked over at it and I said, "You know, thank God I like you, <laughs> yeah. and thank God you yeah. like me, because now we realize like it's just me and you now." Yeah. And a lot of people get to that spot in their life where it's the busyness of life, where it's yeah, you know, the nine to five for both parents, it's the t ball and yeah. and 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 schooling and homework for the kids, and you're so fast moving, and then before long it's all gone, and then you go. Oh hi! Um, <laughs> yeah, what's nice your name you. again? Yeah. <laughs> and you don't, you know, and you, you don't even really know each other. Are much less like each other. Yeah. And I and I, I think a lot of couples don't don't realize that you know that it, in the end it, it it really is just you and your wife, and you have to learn how to really like one another. Yeah, absolutely. And I I tell everyone like my wife and I have actually talked about doing marriage counseling again, not because anything's wrong, but because we just that one yeah. session or you know it was a couple of weeks, but getting that counseling before marriage there was questions that were brought to the table that i would have never thought about had it not been brought brought up you know so i think i think everyone should go through marriage counseling man yeah. even if things are going great you know and and like i said my wife and i we plan to do it you know cuz you never want to just assume that everything's perfect you know right. so that's awesome man yeah 
I appreciate you coming out, bro. Dude, I'm stoked, man. I, I appreciate uh, you coming out. I, 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 you know, we got one more thing we like to do here in the podcast, <laughs> man. Ready. You know what I mean? It, it's it's a little thing me and Cam do, and it's uh the Furious Five. Okay, all right, ready. So I, I think uh, I wrote it down here. Pop it out a little bit, but um, I got a, I, of course I I got music to it, bro. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm ready. Furious Five for Jacob Donnie. Check them out. Envision tattoo. Check them out online. We'll, we'll, we'll get the shout outs after. Question number one. Your favorite tattoo artist of all time. You only can pick one. Um, your Michael Jordan, your Kobe, your Walter Payton. I would say living. There's a guy named Paul Doubleman. And okay. to me, he is a modern day legend. And the fact that every tattoo he does is perfect every time. Now, there's other guys I like as much as him, but as far as the guy that just all around has tattooing figured out, I would say Paul Doubleman. Paul Doubleman. I'm going to have to look that dude yeah, up. Yeah, he's dope. What per- Number two, what person had the biggest impact on your life? Man, you're hitting me with all this. <laughs> Honestly, my wife. Your wife? My wife. How long yeah. have you guys been together now? 12 years. 12 years. So you yeah. guys got together young? Yep. Nice. Yeah, and she... It's just funny, man, because I've been a bonehead so many times. But when I look back on our entire relationship, I'm like, man, where were all the times she was, you know, a bonehead? I'm like, she wasn't. <laughs> she was. Anytime she was acting wild or crazy, it was in response to something stupid I was doing. You know what I mean? It sounds familiar <laughs> over here, bro. <laughs> yeah, man. So I, I'm, I'm thankful she's in my life, man. That'd That's good. good. Number three. This, this is going to be a tough one for you, dude. You only can listen to one band for the rest of your life. What band is it? Dang. You don't go easy on me, man. Not today. Um, I, I can't prepare. Honestly, a band that really speaks to me both lyrically and music-wise is uh, they're a metal band called August Burns Red. Okay. Um, there's other bands I like just as much as them, but I think solely for the message... I would pick them. Okay. So rest we, of your life. Yeah. How many albums do they have? At least six. Oh, oh that's so enough. That. That's enough. Oh, okay. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> that's this a, is a tie because Metallica would be my other one. Metallica, yeah. Yeah, just for overall because I've been listening to them since a kid. But as far as like getting me through life and things like that, it would be August Prince Red. And it would have some some points in your life where you can say, yeah, that song came out here. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So I think, especially in 2020. August Burns Red, their lyrics just really, really helped me. So nice. Yeah. Number four. If you had a band right now, what would the name of the band be? <laughs> it's funny that you say that because I, I'll I, randomly think about that. Yeah, you know what's funny is I, I still think of band names. I'll tell you my band name after this, but go ahead. And band name. Let me hear your band name so I can think about this. My for a band second. name. If, uh, this is this is this is just a little side project. You know what I mean? A little pop punk band. Since you're here today, you know yeah. what I mean. But it would be called Clear and Present Strangers. <laughs> I like that's that. my pop punk band. I like that. And clear that- and Present Strangers. <laughs> Not always- Clear and Present Danger. Clear and Present Strangers. And those are my clever, favorite right? band names when it's like something <laughs> clever. Um, man, you might have me beat on this one because. Trying to think, band name. Um, I don't know, man. You got me. Stumped. Oh man, you're gonna you're gonna have to write that I'm, one. I'm in. gonna have to follow up with this one because <laughs> I stumped somebody on the Furious Five. You got me good because I thought for sure I'd have an answer for everything. Um, yeah, man, that's a tough one, man. All right, I think you might have stumped me, Dave. I'll let you think about that one. I will. Last one, number five. Where do you see yourself in five years? Hmm, That's a good question. I would like to be giving back to tattooing. I think with tattooing, it's easy to get caught up in take, take, take. But as I'm getting older, I'm like, how can I give back to something that's given so much to me? So I would say whatever I'm doing business wise, it would be giving back to tattooing and then spending more time with the family, of course. Nice. And 
honestly just using the gifts that God's given me in an authentic way, because I think it's easy to do flashy things or things that, you know, you feel compelled to do or obligated to because of your faith. But I just want to use my art in a way that's authentic to me that I think will make a difference in people's lives. Nice. Yeah. It's funny as you get older, like you, you think like, you don't want to be in the front anymore. You kind of want to do things in the background. Nobody sees yeah. and just make a difference. You want to be the high. drummer, not the singer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Hey, man, I appreciate you yeah, uh, of course, man. coming out to the podcast, man. Is there anything you want to shout out? Uh, shout it out, man. Your Instagram, your shop, whatever you want to shout out. Yeah, I mean, I definitely want to shout out both my shops. Um, follow all the artists at my shops. Um, the Instagrams are at Envision Tattoo. That's the Grand Terrace location. And then at Envision Tattoo Marietta is our Marietta location. Everyone there does dope work. So people that want to get tattooed and say they don't want to wait or whatever, we got a bunch of good guys. Check them out. And then uh, follow my clothing page. It's at Traditions Collection. And Solid. Yeah, always putting out new stuff, and I have a lot of fun doing it. And then, uh, yeah, th- those are the two main things. Then I got my email and all that on my And your Instagram? Instagram? Uh, at Jacob Donnie Tattoo. Um, so I am only booking out a month at a time right now. Again, that's just to keep things more balanced. So, yeah, it must be nice. To this guy, <laughs> you know what I mean, I, know. Hey, I appreciate you coming out. Dude, bro. Thanks for having me, Dave. It was an absolute pleasure. Awesome.